uh, we move on from Asia to Europe, and in the process, we miss the tip of Africa, you know, which is Egypt, Libya, Sudan, you know, Algeria. So these are the coastlines of the north of Africa, which were in inhabited since time immemorial. Uh, recent archaeology has traced the beginnings of civilization in Egypt way back to 5000 BCE or 6000 BCE or even 7000 BCE. So uh, uh, the picture that you see here on the top right is a very famous Egyptologist or a, an archaeologist who was actually born in Kolkata during the British rule in India. But she went back to London and became a very famous uh, archaeologist. Her name is Margaret Murray, Dr. Margaret Murray. And she dedicated her life for the study of Egyptian sciences, Egyptian folklore, Egyptian society, Egyptian civilization, and things like that. And uh, I'm saying it right in the beginning. She found out a very strong and very strange and uh, enigmatic, unexplainable relationship between the earliest settlements of Egypt and that of India. OK, so in that sense, uh, she contributed a lot to the original connections of the Egyptian civilizations, and she found out that per perhaps uh, some of the trade linkages of Egypt with the rest of the world included India and in, across the Arabian Sea. So this was something very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So Shivangi, I think hopefully you're recording. Yeah, and uh, yes. and uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, so with this background, we'll move on with the chronology of ancient Egyptian settlements. And uh, this is something which is a very interesting, a very intriguing. Why I'm saying intriguing because the moment we talk about Egypt. We think about uh, you know some strange beginnings of the society. We think about a strange conception about life, evolution, and the ways of civilization. We also think about uh, a slightly different approach of looking at nature, its relationship with the human society, and most importantly, uh, that reigned the Egyptian mind was the concept of afterlife. So like the Indians, to an extent, the Egyptians believed in uh, reincarnation. Uh, what you call transmigration of souls. So the Egyptians, like the Indians, believed in the ideas of souls. And they also believed in something which is called metem, metempsychosis. Metempsychosis, which means not only souls travel from one body to the next body, but they also carry with them an impression of their previous lives. You know. So in these regards, the two civilizations share a lot, but the Egyptians differed with the Indian civilization in a certain way because the Egyptians, unlike the Indian civilization, emphasize mostly on the material aspects of these beliefs, of the mystic beliefs, and uh, its expression in day-to-day -day life, in ex its expression, in day to day society, in ex its expression, in its built environmental arts and sciences. Why I mention arts and sciences? Because the Egyptians independently developed a very strong body of literature on building art, you know, their iconographies, their hieroglyphics, which is the art of writing, and their various uh, modes and means of sculpturing and indicating different approaches was very exclusive, very special. At the same time, they also developed a very strong, complex uh, structure or an embodiment of a building. You know, uh, let's mention the Egyptian pyramids. I mean, everybody knows Egypt. The moment you talk about Egypt, the word pyramid flashes your mind, you know, something huge, something very large, something which is classical, you know, something which is just not related to the average building scale. It's not a apartment block or a flat where you're in. 
uh, you are standing in front of a structure which is probably 10 story high and uh, it has got no other functions but to preserve the mummies of the Egyptian king and the queen. The queen gets a larger importance because in the ancient time, the Egyptian society was predominantly matriarchal, predominantly female lined, you know, from one queen, uh, the lands and the ownerships over the regions were transferred from one generation to the next generation. So this is something very interesting. So there Egypt has got some similarity with the ancient Indian society because the ancient in Indian Ari Arya or Arjo society was also very largely uh, matriarchal because the great goddesses of India were also reflected in the great goddesses of Egypt, you know, like Isis and others. So we'll dis discuss very precursorly uh, about Egypt in this aspects. So the built environmental technology had two major domains of arts and sciences. You know, it's very, very important. And the most important thing is the, is the geographical scape, the geoscape of Egypt. As you see, if you can see my cursor, can you see my cursor? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So where am I? Can can someone say? So which which river is this? Everybody knows this. Which river is this? This is the river? Nile. So the Nile River. Nile, yeah. Nile. The famous, yeah. The famous river Nile, which uh, uh, which Indians is to call Nil Nad. Nil means blue. So there are actually two Niles, which comes from the south of Egypt, the White Nile and the Blue Nile, and they come from the mountainous regions of Central Africa. And uh, there, the geographical terrain is mostly forest uh, lands, the famous forests of Africa with large valleys and everything. You know, if you have seen that movie, I'm sure all of you in this class have seen the two or three movies uh, on mummy, you know, mummy one, mummy two, mummy three. And very recently, another new movie has been made on mummy, which is a slightly different version of mummy. So there you have seen that uh, Egypt is largely divided into two major geographical scapes, one in the south of Egypt, which is mostly mountainous, and the river is uh, coming through the valleys, and the valleys are pretty steep, and, and the crevices are very sharp. And the average geomorphological terrain is mostly rocky, mostly rocky. That means as building materials, rocks of different shades and hues and types are available in this valley. And as the Nile comes and goes and hits the upper portion, the lower portion of Egypt, which means northern Egypt, it as it comes from the upper Egypt, which was, which means higher Egypt, southern Egypt, and as it enters the lower portion of Egypt, which is northern Egypt, it finally enters the desert plains, mostly on the west, the huge desert of Sahara of Egypt. And, and finally, it enters the mouth, which is the delta of Nile. And there sits one of the most important cities of uh, the, in, the late ancient world, which is Alexandria. When Egypt was finally invaded by the great emperor Alexander and finally uh, the Egyptian civilization came to an end. This is something about uh, 500 BCE and then the Greeks take over Egypt under the two uh, major domains. So one was the Macedonians who mostly ruled over the upper Egypt. Uh, I'm sorry, the upper Greece and went towards Asia and that's the region that was very close to India, which was the Bactrian king, kingdom, whereas the other portion, which is the Ptolemies, they control mostly the, the Egyptian portions. And under the Ptolemies, after Emperor Alexander in 350 BCE, Alexandria became a very important port city of Egypt. And Egypt was again made known to the entire world because Alexandria not only became a great port center where Ships is to come from Persia, which is Iran, you know, from Sumeria, which is Iraq, you know, from Turkestan, which is Anatolia, from the other countries of southern Europe, including Rome, 
and the different portions of northern western Egypt, which is Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. But it also got converted to a very important uh, business and most importantly, an educational center. I think we all are familiar about the famous lighthouse of Alexandria, which is to control the port activities and the famous uh, library of Alexandria, which is to control over the educational activities of, of Egypt. So with these, Egypt again became known to the, the later world and within 300 or 400 years, it was the beginning of Christianity. So Egypt was also the birthplace of the second form of Christianity, which was the Christianity of St. James, St. John and others. And, uh, and especially the Christianity, which was born from desert monasticism of Egypt, was mostly known as Coptic Christianity. So we are almost coming close to 100 AD. And with this, the famous Egyptian civilization almost comes to an end. And all the days of pyramids and everything becomes a past. It becomes discontinuous. And then in about another 600 years, Islam is born and then it invades Egypt. And Egypt mostly gets transferred to the new religion. But the Egypt that we are going to talk about today is about 5,000 years, which is from about 5,500 BCE to about 500 BCE. That's the Egypt we are going to talk about today. So with this background, we move on to the next 30 to 35 slides. And in the end, we'll discuss about a possible assignment based on Egypt, based on the last two things that we had discussed, which is uh, Sumeria, Mesopotamia and uh, Iranian Persian civilization. So I think based on this, we'll have a we'll have a combined presentation. OK, so let's move on. Uh, you just confirm that the slide is changing. So can you read this slide? Sreyash, can you read this slide? Yes. Hello. Sir. Anyone yes, else? Boku? Yeah. So can Low you read Egypt. what's Lower Egypt? OK, fine. So I just want to make sure. So what do you see? What do you see out here below? You can see that the greenery, the green along the both sides of the river, the available green was not that much when you're in Upper Egypt or Southern Egypt, but it, it increases uh, as we enter the mouth, the delta of the Nile, and it touches the, the Southern Mediterranean Sea. So you see a picture of the Nile coming from uh, the, the higher Egypt, which is Southern Egypt or Upper Egypt, and it's finally approaching the delta. And you see another another uh, another version of the ma same map which is shown up where you can see a huge Nile, Nile Delta and then it di diminishes into a small into a small tail. You know, it's almost like a it's small, uh, almost like a deep sea fish where it's like a, the shape of a very large plate in the southern half and just a tail kind of a thing which goes below. So which proves that uh, the available greenery and the inundation or the flood plains of the line was more scanty and scarce in the in the southern portion of the Egypt and it became more and more available in terms of expanse, available geographical space and the extent of the inundation of the river as we enter lower Egypt. That means as you come down low towards the sea, which is northern Egypt. So the picture that you see in the background is that of uh, the three great pyramids, the three great pyramids, the three great great pyramids at Giza, which were built by some of the early middle order pharaohs. Uh, so the word pharaoh actually comes from an ancient word which is known as Fura, Fura, uh, which means somebody who is inside a very large establishment. Now this word is pretty close to an ancient Indian Sanskrit word, which is Pura. You know that's why we have words like Rajpura, Nagpura. In 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 uh, Sumeria, you also saw those ancient cities like Nippura, Sippura, and Ura, which is Ur, and things like that. So Egyptians also had this famous word, which is Fura, 
So this word actually became a very famous word in Germany, which was the Führer. You know, that, that is to determine Adolf Hitler. Now he's like the head, the head of the entire Germanic society. That was during the Second World War. So the Führer actually meant uh, a man of great energy, a man of great fire. And, and some people believe the word fire or fury or pyre, P-Y-R-E, which means uh, pyring, that means burning dead bodies in fire actually originates from these words. So the word pyramid is a combination of two words, which is fura and madis, which is middle, middle. That means there is some fire in the middle. That means there's some life in the middle. There is some representation of life in the middle. So you build a structure, which is like the pyramid, the base is a square, and then it shoots up to an apex. So the entire structure holds in itself the entire core, old structure holds in itself something which is warm, which is still living, which has the promise of life, after life and resurrection. So long after the Pharaoh is gone and dead, the Pharaoh remains as a principle of life. After the death, it remains as a principle of resurrection. That means after it is gone and after it is dead, there is a chance that the Pharaoh will come back again as the resurrector of the entire Egyptian society. So death and resurrection, I'm repeating, death and resurrection became the lifeline of Egyptian, you know, Egyptian basis, which is psychology, archaeology, its arts, its build form, and also its built engineering, structural engineering of making the pyramids and also the and, and also the architectural shapes and forms. So this entire syntax, this entire glossary of Egyptians architectural forms was actually founded. It was based. It was based on it was based on a very strong body of literature, which was known as the Book of the Dead. I think all of you uh, have seen that movie Mummy. So in Egypt, everything was opposite. The Book of the Dead is actually the Book of the Life. That means if you are dead, the chances of resurrection is very high. And if you are actually living, then you are going to die. So, so the Egyptians always had a, a different approach to life. They have a they had an inverted version of life. So for them uh, to go below and and be embodied or tombed inside uh, a temple or a mansion, uh, which later became a pyramid, I'll I'll show you in later slides, is actually a celebration is actually a celebration. So you go down deep inside a pyramid and the and the mummy is stored and preserved for thousands and thousands of years with all the ingredients and facets of afterlife and its resurrection. Everybody knows the word resurrection. So death and resurrection became a very important foundation of Egyptian life and philosophy. And it became the foundation of the latest Semitic religions like Christianity, you know, like the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even in Islam, the people are tombed, you know, like the Taj Mahal, where Shah Jahan and Mumtaz are tombed inside and they are awaiting resurrection so that they are, their soul or their Noor, you know, Noor Jahan, Noor, which is the light of God inside the human body, is awaiting a res resurrection to be merged with the divine, which is supreme God, Allah in Islam. So outside or from external principles, Islam looks different, Christianity looks different, and Egyptian uh, folklore and belief systems looks different. But deep inside, these three or four systems of thought principles shared a common foundation, you know, Egypt, Christianity, and Islam. So if you see the Da Vinci Code, which was acted by Tom Hanks, you know, a very famous movie on Christianity, you know, some of the controversies. Right in the beginning of the movie, if you see the first 10 or 15 minutes, they discuss Egypt. And they show that the concept of death and resurrection, that the concept of Madonna and the child, the concept of Virgin Mary and the little baby Jesus is actually born from Egypt. It comes from the idea of Isis, which is the mother, and its son, which is Horus. You know, in, in India, we also have similar concepts, you know, like Parvati and Ganesha, 
or you can say Parvati and Kartikeya, which is Murugan, Subramaniam Swami in the south. In the north, uh, in, in Andhra Pradesh, he is known as Vice Vishak, you know, Vishakapattanam. In, uh, especially in the north, he is very famous as Kartik, especially in Bengal, he is also known as Kumar. So these ideas about the sun. So Kalidash writes a very famous book called Kumar Shambhav, the birth of the sun, the divine sun, the birth of the sun god. So he's both a son, S-O-N, and he's also the son, S-U-N. So, so there is a double connection between the son, who, which is born as divine, and also the sun god, which is the sun in the sky. So probably nobody knows the two words have a common origin. You know, they have a common origin. And if you come to Egyptian syntaxis, religion, and belief, you can find a lot of evidences with regard to the common origin. So, so the picture that you see on the right where my cursor is, can everybody see my cursor? Yeah. Can everybody see my cursor? Hello? No, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So on the seat, yeah, so this is one of the most famous pharaohs of, of uh, Egypt. He's, he's known as Menkura. Menkura. And a Khufu, Kafra, and Menkura were the three famous pharaohs in whose name the three famous pyramids of Egypt at Giza were built. The picture that you see here, you know, the picture that you see here. And uh, he's sitting on a throne. And there is something on the throne, uh, you know, the symbol of a double trident, which I'll discuss uh, later, which is actually the symbol of the unification of Egypt, you know. The upper Egypt and the lower Egypt. That means the southern Egypt and the northern Egypt. A lot of scholars agree that this is a symbol of the two halves, the geographical scape of Egypt. But some scholars who have gone into the Book of the Dead and the Book of the Life, they say this is actually the combination of the two sides of Egyptian mythology, life here and the life on the other side of death, which is afterlife and immortality. So after the Pharaoh is expected to be resurrected, he combines the truth and the power and the light of the sun, which is uh, which is Amon or Atom. You know, these are some of the sun gods, Amon Re. So the word Re, R E, is a is an ancient Egyptian word, which is very close to the Indian word of Ra. You know, so the word Re means the ray of the sun, and Amon is actually the symbol of the ancient. Egyptian sun god. I'll show you as I move on to the next slides. So he sits on a he sits on this pedestal, uh, which shows his stature and dignity. So even the sculpture and the art form, by studying that you can see what kind of pharaoh he was. If he has a single trident, then he is the ruler of one of the halves of the Egypt. But in this case, you can see the double trident on the base. Uh, this is a much better picture later, so I'll show you. So, which shows that he was a great, great pharaoh, and he could unify Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, and probably, probably nobody knows he was also spiritually a little advanced, you know, that kind of a thing. So, the Egyptians combined spiritual implications and material portions of civilization. So, this is something which is very, very important. And below, you can see, uh, you can see. You know, the Pharaoh is being baptized by the Egyptian mother goddess, which is Isis. And she is holding in her left hand. I think everybody can see the symbol of the sacred feminine of mother goddess. Now, today, this is the symbol of uh, this is a symbol of feminine. You know, the ladies or girls in WHO, World Health Organization. So Egypt has really contributed a lot today. Maybe the history of Egypt is all gone. But a lot, lot of symbols uh, are even valid today. You know, for example, the symbol of uh, the symbol of uh, male is actually a circle and an arrow, and the symbol of female is a circle and a half cross, which you see in the hand of Isis, and also in the accompaniment, which is helping Isis to baptize the new pharaoh, the new pharaoh. So you see a very interesting dress here in Egypt which was also evident with the Sumerians in Mesopotamia. So this is what is evident in Lower Egypt. And I think I'll slowly become faster because we are already 
close to 8.30. I just wanted to give you an introduction about the background of Egypt. So with this, we move on to the next slide. So can somebody read what is written on the upper upper portion? Hello, Bokul, can you read? Sir, there is a lag in changing of the slide. Again, the same Sir, problem. It's, it's the lower Egypt slide. Uh, yeah, now it's uh, upper Egypt. Now it's upper Egypt, sir. Now it's upper yeah. Egypt. Okay, I think that's, uh, that's the same problem. Anyway, I think it's the same thing. Otherwise, Shivangi can present. Okay, she has a... So this is upper Egypt where the Nile narrows into the valleys and the large green expanses of the flat plains of the Niles as it is available in the southern Egypt is no more available and the mountainous ranges come close to the Nile and finally the, Na and finally the Nile moves on into Nubia which is evident in the lower map which is uh, into Sudan which is into Sudan so from the very large expanse of the flat plains and going through the desert the Nile fund finally enters the hilly rocky mountainous regions and there the entire Egyptian architectural style and pattern changes. You no more find pyramids. Uh, the, the pyramidal complexes, which are the death, the celebration of death complexes, the, the celebration of death complexes or mortuary complexes, which I'll show you in a later slide, they're all gone. Instead, you find a different kind of architecture that, that you have probably seen partly with Sumerians, you know, building ramps, and building this kind of buildings, uh, which are very orthogonal, very geometrical. So if you look at the buildings here, can you find any similarity with any buildings somewhere else that you have seen? Anyone in the class? Onkar, Raja, can you react? Sir, can you Hello? repeat the question, sir? Yeah, the question is, if you see these kind of buildings, do they look like pyramids? Yes or no? No, sir. They, they don't look at pyramids at all. Instead, look, they look at more formal kind of buildings. So have you seen these kind of buildings anywhere else? By chance? So maybe Rome has some, uh, these continuous pillars like... It is similar to Colosseum. Yeah, absolutely Rome. right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With, with the Greeks and the Romans, with the Greeks and the Romans, the Greco-Roman architecture is very similar to this. So, so it is concluded that the Egyptians really contributed to the orthogonal forms, you know, the, the ortho style forms, you know, the peri styling of the columns. We'll come to that when we come to Greece. So these are, these are building styles which are built beautifully. And I'll show you a uh, I'll show you a, a, a presentation maybe after two, three cl classes. Shivangi, you remember, make, uh, you just make me remember that uh, uh, the presentation on connecting histories. Okay, Shivangi, yeah. Yeah, so, hello, Shivangi. Yeah, so the presentation okay. on connect, uh, connecting histories, you just remind me and I'll present it so they'll find this connection. After I move on to Greece, I'll start presenting that. That will be pretty interesting. Sure. You just remind me once. You see that uh, the positioning of the columns, the styling of the columns, the sculpturing of the columns, the rock cut architectural patterns that evolves from the rocky mountains, the symmetrical structures, they continue through the Romans and the Greeks, the Greeks and the Romans. It finally enters Middle Ages in Europe and they they get repeated even in later Renaissance architecture, and they even come down to, they even come down to India, in Chandigarh, where, where Lee Corbusier builds some of the architectural styles based on this ancient styles of Egyptians. You know, his ideas about pilotis, which is column, the, the shades and the sunlight, the depth and and the montage and the and the and the building scape, all that we think as modern. All that we think they are all done today. But if you look at this structure, if you look at this upper picture in this slide, it looks like a very modern complex, perhaps in three or four levels, which was also partly evident with the Sumerians and in the early pyramids, 
but the Egyptians actually make it asymmetrical and they come from, from the hill terraces and they build this kind of structure. So this is the valley of the kings. This is the valley of the kings in Ibidos or Ubaidos. And some people say there is probably a connection between Ebodos and the Ubaid civilization of Sumeria because there is an architectural connection between the early Ubaid Sumerian buildings that you have seen in the early asymmetrical Sumerian ziggurats and the kind of structures that you see here. Now, this is a very, very interesting connection between Sumeria and Egypt, which shows that it had a Eastern connection and there must have been a connection. So this is a point to be remembered and we'll keep on repeating some of these points as we move on to the Greeks and the Romans and finally to later Western European architecture and finally to the principles of Le Corbusier, you know, when we come to that. So this is a pretty important slide. And the most interesting thing is that this is northern Egypt. I'm sorry, this is southern. I'm sorry. This is southern Egypt and this is upper Egypt because it's why it's upper Egypt because it's up in the hills. The altitude, uh, the level is much higher and the source of this building is rock. It is rock cut. It is absolutely rock cut and uh, and this is and this is so very important. It, this is so very important to understand and the Egyptians absolutely developed a new vocabulary of architecture when they are building in southern Egypt or upper Egypt as against as against lower Egypt or northern Egypt where the available the available uh, built material was mostly adobe, you know, and wattle and dub, wattle and daub, W A T T L E D A U B, which means reed plaster. That means you're making a combination of uh, the flat plain uh, available alluvium soil and using the reed that was born in the plains of River Nile. So that that combination led to the first architecture of Egypt at the mouth of the Nile because I, I did not mention this point. Architectural evidences and archaeological evidences has proved that the Egyptians actually moved into Egypt from a distant land. They are not people from this land. They came from a distant land and they entered Egypt from the upper crown, from the lower crown, from the delta of the Nile, from Alexandrian side. And finally, they moved on farther south and farther south and farther south. So the so the settlements of lower Egypt, which is Giza, Saqqara and Memphis are much older settlements and the settlements in the south like Abydos, Thebes and others are relatively later settlements and more modern settlements. So this is a very important point about the chronology. So if I go to the if I go to the northern Egypt, which is lower Egypt, I get buildings which are I get building complexes. I get the pyramids. I get the pyramidal complexes. So it's absolutely a different category or vocabulary of architecture compared to that. The southern category or the northern Egyptian category are mostly structures, complexes that you see here. You know, they are non pyramidal structures. They have a touch of pyramid. They're moving from the lower level to the upper level, but the purpose is quite different. There are tombs in this building, but the significances of these buildings are quite different. It will be more evident as we move on. OK, so let's move on to the next slide and you tell me where you can see the next slide. You tell me when you can see the next slide. Not yet, sir. Not yet. OK, till the slide comes, I'll talk about. So this slide, when it comes, hopefully. It's there, sir. OK, it has come. So you can see the gift of the Nile. So Egypt, everybody knows, is actually is actually is actually a gift of the Nile, a gift of the Nile. If Nile was not there, Egypt was not born. The word Egypt comes from the ancient Greek word Egyptos, which comes from the word Egyptia, which means the land of the gypsies, which means the Egyptians must have come from a distant place or another country and had come and entered this land as gypsies. It was also 
known as the black land, which is Mizara. So Egypt in the ancient literature is also known as Mishr or Mizra, Mizra, Mizra. And and the Egyptians and the Egyptians believed that they came from a distant land which was known as the land of the Punt or Punt. I'll I'll discuss that when I come to the last slide of the presentation. Uh, that's a, that's a very exclusive thing. And Shivangidi knows we had done a little bit of work on this in our Sandhi years. And I have I personally I personally have a little bit of work. So the Egyptians had a duality of deserts and river valley. They had a duality of life and death. They had a duality of this life and immortality. And this was a very important organizing principles of the Egyptians, and that made them to be very exclusive. So with this, I move on to the next slide. I move on to the next slide. So you tell me when you can see the next slide. So the next slide is on the description of the more ancient portions of Egypt. Shivangi, aap thora confirm karo when we are in the next slide. Yes, sir. Okay, so we are into the ancient Egypt, the establishment of the old kingdom. And I'll, I'll attract your attention towards the top right of the slide, where you can see a distinct description of the three grounds of the Egyptian pyramids. So you can see a pharaoh with a white crown. You can see a pharaoh with a red crown. You can see a pharaoh with a white and the red crown. So the pharaoh with a white crown, the pharaoh with a white crown is the crown of Upper Egypt. The pharaoh with the red crown is the crown of the Lower Egypt. But the pharaoh in the with the white and the red crown, this is a very special crown, is actually a grand master, and he controls both of the halves of Egypt, which I mentioned to you. And this is roughly the time scale when the civilization had begun from about 6000 BC, about 8000 years back, the Egyptian civilizations had begun. And then it had moved down south and it continued from about 3000 BCE on what onwards. That's about 5000 years back. The Egyptians started moving more and more towards northern Egypt, which is upper Egypt. I'm sorry, towards southern Egypt, which is upper Egypt into the more uh, into the more rocky valleys of the Nile. OK. So here is something which is very, very interesting. And not much work has been done here. You tell me when the slide has changed. Yeah, Bakul or anyone. Yeah, has the slide changed? Yes, sir. Now it's yes, yes, sir. sir. Has, okay, so what can you see? Can you describe? You see something which is very strange, of course. Can you react to this slide? A little bit. Let's spend two minutes. Anyone in the class? This looks like the Russian alphabet Z, Z H I, if you know Russian language. Hello? Yes, sir, you're audible. Oh, it also looks like two tridents, you know, like the Trishul of Shiva. So it looks like two tridents. So there's one trident which is looking up and there's one trident which is looking down. It also looks like a, it also looks like something which is built around a central pillar, a central pillar. And the top of the pillar is like a T, which is like a Tau, T-A-U, the Egyptian uh, symbol of lightning. And it and the whole tau comes and hits a bone kind of a structure, which looks like the base of the human body, which is the pelvic girdle. Or it also looks like two chapels, you know, like the two uh, feet footprints of any human being. But it looks like there are two human beings which are maintaining the unification of the upper half of the trident and the lower half of the trident. And this is something which in Egyptian language is known as Sima or Soma, Tawai or Tau. And this is a unification. This is a symbol of the unification of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And this is very, very famous and very, very strong. Not much work has been done on this, but Plato 
of later Greece. Everybody knows Plato. In Plato's work, there's a great reflection of the words of Soma Taui. And Plato used this Egyptian word again and again. And he used the word Soma or Sima as a as a as a as a representation of the word soma, which means somatic, which means body, you know. Because in human life, there are two aspects. One is somatic, which is body, or which is corporeal. The other aspect is psycho, which is non-body, non-corporeal. You know, it is mostly spiritual. So every human being has a combination of psychosomatic, that means spiritual material combination. Perhaps, we don't know, we are not very sure, but perhaps the Somatawi was externally a symbol of the unification of lower and upper Egypt, but in a deeper sense, this was a representation of the material and the spiritual world. The art world, which is here, and the higher world, which is high up in the celestial world. I think we had similar kind of discussions when we had discussed the stupa of Buddhism, and I had shown you the Matri Mandir, and I think uh, Shivangidi and Jesludi had discussed at large about the Matri Mandir. In, a, in the Buddhist stupa, half of the stupa is in, 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 embedded in the earthly plane, and half of the stupa is embedded in the celestial plane. But in Pondicherry, in Auroville, the entire stupa is lifted, and it's a golden stupa. So, so Egypt had similar concepts of the lower crown and the upper crown, the combination of the lower world, the material, tangible, analytical, computed world with the intangible, spiritual, you know, very abstract world, which is higher. So this combination is something which probably is the backbone of Egyptian civilization. If we don't have this backbone, then we are just interpreting uh, pyramids and buildings like that you know we don't have a we don't have a detailed description of a description of a of a very rich civilization that was built on philosophy now the beauty about egyptians is that they were in a position to transfer this philosophy into mathematics into geometry and into build science so the entire pyramid the entire mortuary or death uh, celebration of death complexes was actually the celebration of this philosophy. So remember this slide very well. Now we are moving on. So this is uh, the next slide. You tell me when we are when we have reached this slide. So these are evidences from the ancient Egyptian scripture. Shivangi, you confirm when you can see this slide. Yes, sir. Can you see the slide? Yeah. No, sir. Yes, sir, it's okay. there. It's there. Okay. So this is a unification of the two halves. This is a unification of the two halves. And in Egypt, uh, this was actually celebrated by the consonants, you know, like ka and ba, you know. So the ka, uh, you know, like Sanskrit, the first consonant represented, represented, represented the, the foundation, represented the foundation of uh, the material principles of human body and the word ba represented the foundations of the spiritual body and and if the two things are coming together and if the two things are coming together if the two things are coming together then it is known as the ka and the ba it is known as the ka and the ba so this is something which on which i'll show you a national geographic slide so this is a translation an English, an English translation of from the Book of the Dead, from the Book of the Dead. So this is very mystic. This is pretty complex. If I start explaining, because I'm not an expert on this, it will take a lot of time. But the simple explanation is that the Egyptians were always trying to combine the lower material world with the upper material world, you know, the external world with the internal world. You know, the world of death, which is this world, with the world of afterlife, which is immortality, which is that world. So in that sense, the Egyptians were absolutely engrossed. They're absolutely infatuated with these beliefs. 
So their entire society, their entire literature, their entire architectural styles, their entire expression was revolving and revolving and revolving around this one single principle of the Sema Toy, which is the, in, the unification. So with this, I move on to the later Egyptian kingdom, which is the middle kingdom. Uh, someone confirm, and Bakul, you can confirm when I have moved into, move on to this slide. Onkar, you may confirm. Middle kingdom, yes. So it hasn't changed. It has come? Okay. No, sir, no. Okay. No, sir, no, sir. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So now it came. So now okay. it has come. Okay, thank you, thank you. So there's about a seven, eight seconds lag. Okay, so this is about the mid Middle Kingdom. That's from about 2000 BC and later, where Egyptian society becomes more complex and it develops the same kind of uh, uh, propensities and uh, expressions and features of a material civilization. And this is quite visible. Uh, this is a slide Shivangi Shivangi remembers. This was this is a slide which was developed by Tanima, uh, who is not here anymore. So and uh, and uh, and here you can see the Egyptians are slowly slowly get it uh, invaded by external invaders. You know, like the Hiskos or Hyksos, whatever you call them. So this is here the Egyptian society has become more imperial. It is becoming more in militant. The Egyptian society is also becoming very complex. The Egyptian society is getting segregated and ramified into portions which are rich and imperial and portions which are not so rich and they are slaves. And slaves are invited from different parts. And this is where Egypt becomes the heartland of a very important beginning of one of the most ancient religions of the world, which is Judaism. And one of their earliest prophets, which is Moses or Musha. Musha is the original name and in the Western language pronunciation articulation is known as Moses, was born in Egypt and was raised by Ramesses, one of the Egyptian kings. And finally, he leads the slaves out of Egypt from the bonded land into the promised land across the Red Sea which is Israel today, Israel today. So the Egypt is somehow mentioned even in the Old Testament, you know, which is known as the second book, that, uh, the, which is the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus. That means you are exiting, you are exiting out of a dark land and entering the promised land. So in that sense, the history of Egypt remains as very, very important. And uh, I think if you see some of these movies, uh, very recently the movie uh, Moses and others have been made. So you can, I think some of you have already seen these movies and there they show Egypt, but they show Egypt in a slightly negative fashion because the Semitic race, the Judaic race, the Yehudi race, the Yehudas, the Jehudas, the Judaic races uh, come out more victorious so the Egyptian race are shown as tyrants. They're shown as uh, barbarians. And the Semitic race as, is shown as relatively more civilized and more powerful. OK, so that's about it. That's about the Middle Kingdom where when all these things happen. So with this, we move on to the New Kingdom, which is almost the last phase of Egypt before Alexander comes and takes over. You tell me when you can see this light. The new kingdom that's about 1500 BC onward. So the slide hasn't changed as of now. It hasn't changed yet. So. Okay, let's wait. Anyway, I'll just talk about it. It hasn't changed yet. Yes, sir. Now it has changed. It's taking a lot of time, about 10 seconds. OK, so this is New Kingdom. And these are some of the great kings and queens. So this is Queen Hatshetput, who was a female queen. And she is very famous. And, it, and she made trips to the origin of Egyptians, 
the original land of Egypt, which is the land of Punt. And it is on her expedition, archaeologist, British historian, Margaret Murray, who was born in Kolkata, Calcutta, and became a, a scholar in the University of London, actually worked, and she could trace the land of Punt to India. That's something which is very, very interesting. And you can see the names of other, other Egyptian kings and queens. And you can also see one of the greatest, uh, famous, beautiful queen of Egypt, which is Cleopatra. The queens are very important because, as I told you, uh, the lineage, the heritage, and the transition of properties from one generation to the next was mostly matriarchal. The position of women was very high, unlike the Semitic religions. So even though the Semitic religion claims supremacy, but the Egypts were much more advanced, giving more respect to the women folk compared to the Semitic religions like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So in that sense, the depiction of the story of Moses may not be 100% true. So this is a very important point and argument. One may accept it, one may not. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So this is about art and architecture of Egyptian. I'll move a little faster because we are already, already approaching nine o'clock. So when you see this slide, hopefully, you'll see that this slide is about some of the buildings in lower Egypt, um, in, in, in upper Egypt, in higher Egypt, in elevated Egypt, in Egypt in the hills. So you can see some of the buildings which were unlike the pyramids, which were unlike the pyramids. You confirm when you can see this slide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so you, uh, on the top right, you can see the Egyptian columns. You know, so these are non-typical Egyptian columns. The other columns I'll show you later. So the Egyptian columns are very complex. You know, they are filled up with stories and embossing and and uh, and and an absolutely engraving of afterlife stories and different kind of uh, rituals and performances uh, that the Egyptians uh, were you know, conducting in different ages. So it's a combination as it's as it's evident in the slide of paintings, embossing, curved stone images, hieroglyphics, and three-dimensional statues. What do you see in bottom right? What do you see in bottom right is actually the sphinx is actually a sphinx, which has a human or a lion head and a a lion's reins and a combination of something which is like a Aries, a lamb, which is known as a sphinx. So these are very complex Egyptian motifs, which are mostly astral, which is a combination of Leo and Aries and, uh, and, uh, and other things like Capricorn. They all come together, which shows that the sun is moving from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere and from the northern hemisphere back to the southern hemisphere and it's transcending and it's transcrossing all the zodiac symbols and by the way the 12 zodiac symbols uh, were also born from egypt other than india if there's any country where the zodiac symbols were born that was egypt you know that was egypt so this is something that that is a point to be remembered okay so i'm moving on to the next so the previous slide, as you as you just saw, was that of Upper Egypt. Now I am showing you a slide of Lower Egypt, that of the pyramids. You tell me when you can see this slide. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. You can see the slide. So you can see some of the world's greatest multi-storied structure. They are not storied, but they are developed in storied. So this is a pyramid of Giza, that of Khufu, Kafra, and Menkura. And, uh, and, the, and this particular slide shows some techniques by which uh, huge blocks of stones were taken over ramps, through ramps, to upper levels and crowns. And that is how they were built. That is how they were built. So I think I have one or two slides on this, which will explain the whole phenomenon in a much bigger way and from a more analytical an engineering perspective. So I move on to the next slide. So you tell me when you can see this slide. So in this slide, you'll actually see not only a pyramid, but a pyramidal complex, a pyramidal complex. 
a pyramidal construction theory. You confirm when you can see this light. Yeah. Yeah. So you, here, after you see this slide, you'll be able to see the entire pyramidal complex. Is the slide visible, Shivangi? Uh, no, now it's visible. Not yet. Okay. Yes, sir. It's visible. The okay. other pyramid construction theory. Yeah, the other pyramidal construction theory. So this is the pyramid of, of Jose, you know, at Saqqara. And, uh, and here you can see the combination of pyramids, the galleys or the connections from the pyramids to the mortuary ritualistic complexes. And from there you move on to the Nile. So that means you're moving from the Nile to the intermediate mortuary complexes. So here you see buildings that you'll also see in Greece and Rome at a later point of time. And from there you see the, the connections to the pyramids and then the pyramids itself. So the Nile had the connections of the boat rides which was symbolic of afterlife. That means the upper boat and the lower boat. That, mean, that means the boat is to carry the soul into the afterlife and bring it back again for resurrection. And that promise was maintained by the rituals of the car and the bar, which is known as the mansion of the car that you see here. You know, those four columns, you know, peristyle buildings in the intermediate. And in the, in the distance, you can see the pyramid. In the distance, you can see the pyramid. So this is something which is very, very important for us to understand. And uh, and the solar barks, which were the Nile boats, were actually just not maritime uh, agents, just not commercial agents, but they also represented the journey uh, of afterlife from this world to the next world and from the next world back again into this world. OK, so I'm moving on to the next slide, and this is a very important slide. This is a very important slide. You tell me when you can see this slide where we look at inside the pyramid and the inside of the pyramid is actually the outside of the pyramid. So this is something which is based on a modern science which is emerging, which is known as archaeoastronomy. Uh, uh, you can confirm when you can see this yes, slide. Yeah, so you can see how the pyramid was built from the initial tomes, which are known as mastabas, you know, that yellow, yellow patch on the top right. And on the bottom, in the middle left, you can see the inside of the pyramid. And on the right hand side middle, you can see the connections between the pyramid and the distribution of stars in the sky. So the pyramids were located and, and the pyramids were oriented based on the orientation of the stars. So there is a huge footfall or footprint of the stars in the sky to the buildings that the, that the Egyptians built on the earth. And this is something which is very important for us to understand, for us to understand. And this connection of understanding architectural built forms through astronomical uh, understandings and softwares is a modern science of archaeoastronomy. Uh, I have three slides after this. I'll go through them very quickly. I'll go through them very quickly where there is a I'll just give you a glimpse. I just explained this in a different class, which is under the ICAS, the Indian knowledge system. So you tell me when you can see this slide. You tell me this is based on something which is just discovered in the last uh, few hundred years, precisely through mathematics, which is known as the precision of the equinox, which is known as the precision of equinox. Yes, sir. OK, so can you see something which is rotating? Can you see that? Can you see? Can you see the rotation? Can you see the? Can you see something? Yes, OK, so what is that? Can yes, someone, what is it? In physics, what do we call it? Hello, in physics, what do we call it? This is known as a gyroscope. Hello, can you hear me? 
audible, yeah, so this is a gyroscope. So what happens? The earth moves around the sun and the moon moves around the earth. The moon moves around the earth and, in, and it takes about 27 days for the moon to complete one cycle. You know, that's why we have the lunar month. The earth moves in 365 days. That's, we have, that's why we have the solar month and the solar year. And that's why we have two principles of geocentric, which is the moon move, moving around the sun, earth, and heliocentric, the earth moving around the sun. Now, in addition to these two movements, there is a third movement, which is very slow, and that takes place over 26,000 years. And then it come back, comes back to that original position. It's not possible for me to explain everything today in the class. So this is called the precision of the equinox. So you can see on the, on the top left that the axis of the Earth. So while the Earth is moving around the sun, the axis of the Earth slowly tilts. So you can see the file, the precision and 26,000 years on the middle right. So while the Earth is moving around the sun, the Earth axis also tilts from facing a certain value in the galactic sky. And it takes about 26,000 years to come back to that same position. So as it is moving over a span of 26,000 years, if in our ancient literature we have different descriptions of the sky, so based on certain softwares, we, we can predict when it was recorded and what was the picture, whether it was 5,000 years back in those last 26,000 years or 7,000 years back or 8,000 years back. That is based on a software, uh, a series of softwares which are, no, which are known as the archaeoastronomical softwares. Now, this has been applied on Egyptian ancient literature on the observations of constellations and the positions with respect to Orion or Sirius and other stars. And it has been confirmed the Egyptian civilization is about 8,000, 7,000 years old. It is confirmed. So I'm moving on to the next slide. I'm moving on to this next slide. You confirm that uh, you, you are seeing this slide. So in this slide, while you see, you see, you see the name of the softwares, you know, so these are some of the name of the softwares which are available. You confirm when you can yes, see sir. this slide. Yes, yeah. So in the bottom left, you can see the softwares. Some of these softwares are even produced by Planetarium Group and Microsoft Group. They're all advanced software. So you can see the description of a certain sky. On the top right, you can see that the Earth magnetic axis rotates. So at a certain point of time, the Polaris, the pole star is visible. A certain point of time, the Vega star is visible as a, as a North Pole, which is a galactic North. So if that description is there, and if we put that description in the planetarium software, so that description comes from a certain text of Egypt or from India or from ancient Rome, then we can clearly predict that when it was recorded. And in many cases, it has gone back to 4000 BC or 3000 BC in Egypt. In India, in the Rig Veda, for example, some of the computations have gone back to 7000 BC or 8000 BC, which shows that the Vedic civilization is about, it's about 9000 or 10,000 years old. So this entire idea of Aryan invasion or Aryans coming to India and forming the Aryan civilization falls flat, it collapses. So today, science by virtue of archaeoastronomy has proved. So this is a very famous book by uh, by Gulio Magli. Uh, so I have this book with me. So when I meet you later, hopefully next year, I'll show you a copy of this book. A portion of this book is available. So all ancient structures around the world, including the Stonehenge, which was a solar observatory, including Egyptian structures, and including some of the petroglyphs of Konkan at Ratnagiri in India, and a lot of descriptions in our Mahabharata, Ramayana, you know, the death of Vish Vishwa, for example, at a certain planetary conjunction. And when those planetary conjunctions were fed into the archaeoastronomical software, 
the software computer predicted that date is something about 3100 BC, which means the Battle of Mahabharata is about 5100 years old. And that really coincides with the end of uh, Indus Valley Civilization. So the end of Indus Valley Civilization, the destruction of Dharaka, the destruction of Gujarat, the, the death of Vishwa, and the prediction of the astronomical software, as it's evident, they're all coinciding. Now, this is very, very important. This is extremely important. This is science. This is not prediction. This is not simulation by intuition. This is all computation and algorithm. Through so these, we are. that's why I'm sharing this with you, because you guys are brilliant, intelligent people, and you have a whole future in front of it, in front of you. So in the assignment that you're going to do in the coming one month, I think if some of you, I'm not saying all of you, I think one group can focus on the archaeoastronomical softwares and can bring about a little, a small description of the implications of ancient civilization. I mean, I love to see if Bakul or, uh, or Swatika or Sreyash or Raja or anyone or Somia, they're all working on these. Uh, I, know, I mean, mostly from secondary literature available in the Google. I'll moving on to the next uh, slide. You tell me when it's visible. And these are some of the great scholars in India uh, who has actually worked on the archaeoastronomical softwares. The third picture, the third picture is is that of uh, the third picture is that of uh, is that of Professor uh, Bhalia of TIF or Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and they have done a lot of work on archaeoastronomical software. You tell me when you can see this yes, slide. Sir. Yeah. And the fourth picture is Professor Amitabh Ghosh. I am sure Shivangi has met him one or two times. Shivangi, we have met Professor yes. Amitabh Ghosh. Yeah, so he is a famous professor. He is the former director of IIT Kharagpur when I joined about 20 years back, 22 years back. And he is the honorary scientist of the Indian National Science Academy. And he's also the founder professor. And he's an expert in archaeoastronomy and this is the book which is published by him descriptive archaeoastronomy and ancient indian chronology where he has predicted many of the rig veda sutra by virtue of planetarium softwares microsoft softwares to about 7000 bc 7500 bc 8000 bc or even 9000 bc which shows that the ancient indian civilization is that old so i'm moving to the next slide and these are some other scholars you confirm that when you are seeing this slide, this is uh, Mr. Talgeri on the bottom right, and this is Mr. Narhari Achar on the on the bottom left. You tell me when you can see this slide. You confirm when you can this see this. So these are other scholars. So so this is a galaxy of literature review, which I have done for for you on just to show yes, you sir. just to show you the great work. And similarly, there are there are works which has been done on Egypt. So these lights, because you guys are all boys and girls of science, so we should not just assume things and predict like a quack. We should be hundred percent scientific. And today, science is capturing the ancient dates. So this is very very interesting. And so this is one particular example from the Rig Veda, which is the next slide. I've changed my slide. So there is a description in the Rig Veda from the fifth mandala where the, the Ashwin Nakshatra or the constellation is visible at dawn. Now this could have been only visible at dawn something about 9000 years back. It became invisible after that and it was invisible before that. So today the planetarium softwares have proved it. Can you see this slide by now? Yes. Yeah, you can see the Rig Veda 5.77 1.2. So there is a sage whose name is Bhoma, and he he comes from the lineage of Saptarshi. Uh, so he is Atreya. So he comes from the lineage of Atri. So he only belongs to about 8000 BCE, which is about 10,000 years old. So the Saptarshis, the seven sages are definitely much older to him. So this is the middle order of the Rig Veda. 
So this is something which is very, very interesting and similar connections are done with regard to Egypt. So with this, I move on to the pyramids. And this is the uh, this is the pyramidal complex of Saqqara. So now you have to understand. Now you have to feel you confirm when you can see this slide. So the pyramids were both. Yeah, so the pyramids were both a symbol of afterlife and life on this earth. And the pyramids were also a tunnel. It was a connect between this world and that world between this world and connect and that world. And this is one of the earliest pyramids of Egypt, which is a stepped pyramid from where the original tombs, the original tombs, which was just an or the tomb that you see in any cemetery, whether it's an Islamic cemetery or a Christian cemetery, was ultimately built upon on steps and the tomb was celebrated as a very large structure and it became a very large uh, form which is the pyramid that you see in Giza, which I've shown you in previous slides, and I'm sure you have also seen it uh, in your history books and in various movies and things like that. But this is an intermediate pyramidal form, which is a stepped pyramid. Now, this is a very interesting form where the Egyptians are giving a lot of emphasis to the Mastaba, which is the original tomb form, which is finally becoming a step pyramid and finally at Giza, it will become a huge pyramid. Now, as you see the plan form, the step pyramid is a part of a very large complex and it is connected with a court which is known as a Sith or the Seth court. So in the Seth court or the Sith court, the, the produce of the Nile, you know, like rice, like maize, like burley, they're all brought here and they were sown on the ground and there are sprouts like the ear of the corn, you know, like harvest. So the pharaoh represented a corn seed like Vijam, you know, it's like Vijam, like a corn seed. Like from a previous harvest, you stored the seed and you use the seed for the next harvest. And one cycle of harvest is continuous with the next cycle of harvest. That means the last cycle of harvest is dead. But the next cycle of harvest is is again reborn, resurrected, like the cycle of harvest in 2020 is all gone. But this year we are having the cycle of harvest of rice and paddy and wheat, which is of 2021. So our Indian farmers are using seeds that comes from the previous cycle. So in the same way, the previous cycle of death is again revived in the next cycle of immortality and afterlife. So the agrarian symbolism, the agrarian lifestyles, the agrarian life cycles, the biological, the hydrological and the ecological life cycles of the agrarian spirit was the symbol of the Egyptian Pharaoh and the queen. So, so that is actually very, very important. So you will see even in India, even in India, if you are doing a sacrifice, you either do a human sacrifice, which is done very ferociously, or if you go to a place like Belur Mutt in Kolkata, or if you go to other temples, they actually sacrifice a vegetable, you know, like a brinjal or maybe a, or a, or a papaya or maybe even a cucumber because the vegetable is a symbol of life of the human being. Shivangi, am I right? Am I right? Yeah, Shivangi. Yes. Yeah, so that means the vegetable of the vegetation, the veg, the vijab, the vijam, as it's mentioned in our Upanishads and in you know, Rig Veda, is a symbol of afterlife. It's a symbol of, that's why in our meditation tradition, that is why in our yoga tradition, the mantra that we decide, you know, like Ram, 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 or Krishna, 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 is known as the Vij Mantra. The word comes from agrarian origin, Vij Mantra. That means it's a root mantra, which is revivable. That means this is a mantra which someone has recited thousand years back, and they have become a Siddh, a Siddh. And this is a mantra which someone will recite a thousand years later, and he or she will also become a Siddh. That means the mantra, the, 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 the principle of life is 
afterlife is immortal. So this is the foundational principle of the Egyptian pyramidal complex, where the pharaoh inside the pyramid is celebrated along with the vegetation produced outside the pyramid in the court. And the two together are built within a single complex. This is the complex of Saqqara. So this is something which is the foundation of the ancient Sidh court. This is very close to the Indian word Sidh, S-I-D-D-H, which means boiling of the corn. You know, Sidh bhat hota hai na, Sidh rice, boiled rice. So after you boil a rice, you cannot sow it again. It goes outside the cycle of life and death. In the same way, the jiva or the ordinary human being who becomes a Sidh escapes the cycle of life and death. He or she can only come back as an avatar like Buddha or Mahavira or Christ to teach the other people so that they become Sidh. So these foundational principles were also applicable to the Pharaoh who represent like Buddha and Mahavira or Christ. The Pharaoh was a symbol of resuscitation or resurrection of the Egyptian society. So this is a point to be remembered. So there's so much to be understood <coughs> in the Egyptian complex. I cannot describe everything. I cannot describe everything which is evident here, but I just gave you a small description. OK, so with this, I move on to some. I think we can escape this slide, uh, which is about the old kingdom and middle kingdom. Just have a look at this. You tell me, Shivangi, when it's visible. So this is so where you can see the, yes. eye, yeah, the eye of the pharaoh, which is also known as the Ankh, A-N-K-H, which is the symbol of the eye. And this is very close to the Indian word Ankh or Akhi, you know, you know like we have Akhi D in the department of, uh, you know, in the School of Infrastructure and Design and Management which represents, so the, the two words are also the same. It's known as Ankh in Egypt, in India it's known as Aki. So this is very, very interesting. I come to the next slide, which is the New Kingdom. So here, here you can see different forms of arts and expressions, which, is, which was developed. And the Egyptians had very famous uh, uh, headdresses, which is Leo or the lion, because the lion symbolized the judgment. Can you see this slide? Yes, sir. Yeah, so here you can see the pharaoh. He is having a Capricornian beard. So the Capricorn is in the Dakshinayan. It's in the winter, the winter solstice, and the and the and the and the and the Leo, the lion, is in the summer solstice. So you have an upper crown which is lion, and you have a lower beard which is Capricorn. So which means the pharaoh that you see here is able to combine the upper world and the lower world. His entire face is a combination, is a combination of the upper world and the lower world. And on his forehead is a famous serpent, which is Urius. You know, like Shiva, the, the serpent is on the head or along the neck. So on Shiva, the serpent is on the head. On Vishnu, the serpent is on the base. So in Egypt, the serpent is on the forehead. So the serpent is a symbol of the internal power, the internal power of the human being, which is known as the Kundali, the coiled power of the human being. OK, OK, so I'm moving on to the next slide. So I'm coming to the, to the famous city of Giza, where you see a large where the step pyramid of Saqqara has now become the huge pyramids a full pyramid, a proper yes. pyramid, a total pyramid, and just not a pyramid, a pyramidal complex. Like the Roman emperors, like Hadrian, Augustus, Caesar, you know, you know they have all built their forums, which we'll explain and discuss you know, after the mid -sense. In the same way, the Egyptian uh, pharaohs Khufu, Kafra, and Mankura, they had built their own pyramids so that they were venerated as the three gods of Egypt. They're just not kings or emperors, but they were god kings. So the Egyptian pharaohs had a material part, a terrestrial part, a somatic part, and it also they also had a spiritual part, a celestial part, a tau part. So it's a combination of the Sema tau, 
the psychosomatic tradition of the Egyptians. Now, this is something which is also evident in Indian religion, which is Agni and Soma. Agni is fire, igneous, and Soma is moon, Sombar. So Agni and Soma vibrates very close with Egyptian Soma Tawi. No. So, so at 1871, under the auspices of the great uh, band of uh, archaeologists who came from England and Germany, Egypt was rediscovered, you know, because Egypt was lost. Egypt was absolutely lost, was absolutely lost. So now I come to the pyramidal institution. These are just some detailed descriptions. You tell me that you can see this slide. You can see this slide. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is on the top left. You can see the pyramidal complex of, of Egypt and you can see the the, the three dimensional view you can see some of the step pyramids that was built initially and finally the very large pyramids and you can see the entire mortuary complex that means it, that means it is just not a pyramid but it was a combination of pyramids with the mortuary temples of the mansion of the ka and the ba which i'll show you just in a moment and you can see the section that is taken through the pyramid inside which you can see the celebrated galley or the sectional a uh, point where the tomb of the Egyptian pharaohs, the king and the queen, queen was kept. The king and the queen was kept. So this is the pyramid of Giza. Compared to that, if you, if I move down to the next slide, you tell me when you can see. You come to a different bodies of building complexes. Yes, sir. Temple institution. Temple institution. You can see very large institutions, very large walls no more pyramids, huge temple complexes, buildings which looks like South Indian temples, you know, South Indian gopurams, you know, you know, you know I mean, a very strange similarity and columns which were very stylized with afterlife, with lily and lotus, which were very symbolic of Egyptian spirituality, like Indian spirituality. They're all built here, you know. Even if you see the ancient... Uh, not ancient, I'm sorry. Even if you see the movie, The Spy Who Loved Me, James Bond, you'll see a little bit of Egypt. You'll see the Karnak Temple. You know, you, you'll see James Bond moving in the Karnak Temple. So this is, so Egypt is always very famous. And today, some of the Egyptian temples and buildings and pyramids are also used to build modern structures. Like the famous La Vega Hotel is an Egyptian pyramid, you know, Egyptian pyramid. So Egypt is lost but somehow Egypt is not lost. It has remained with us and its symbols continue. But unlike India, it was lost. The ancient Egypt, its rituals, its thoughts, its living philosophies, its building principles, its institutional semantics, its, its vocabulary of architecture in, in lower Egypt, its vocabulary, vocabulary of architecture in upper Egypt, they are all gone. They are all lost. So now we have to revive it and under, understand it. But in India, somehow they are all continuous. Though there have been attempts to discontinue it, but in India, somehow they are continuous. So I'm giving you some examples in the next slide. There are other, other, other areas, uh, other cities that were built in Egypt. This is the ancient Egyptian settlement that you'll see when this slide comes to you, which is the, which is the settlement of the ancient city of Luxor. Luxor. If you can see this slide, once it's visible to you, it's it'll be it's called the city of Luxor, the city of Luxor, and uh, yes, sir. yeah. So you can see the layout in reality, and this is how it looks like. This is absolutely a city where the rich people and the not so rich people used to say. So the, 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 the Egyptians categorically had segregated or classified towns for rich people and classified towns for service people and classified towns for slave people. This There is a strange connection between the kind of varnas that we had in India at our ancient times, you know, like the priestly society of Egypt, the Brahminical, you know, the Pharaoh society of Egypt, the Kshatriyas, the service people and the merchantine people of Egypt, the Vaishyas, and then the slave people of Egypt, the Shudras. That's very simple. I don't want to make a direct connection, but there is a 
a bit of analogy which can be observed. That's undeniable. So now I move on to another slide. So that was Luxor. Now I move on to a, actually a very important maritime city, which is also studied in city planning as one of the most ancient cities of Egypt. This is the city very close to Giza complex, which is known as Tel Amarna. Uh, confirm when you can see this slide. Yes, sir. So on the left hand side, you, you see one kind of complex, which is the famous Giza complex on right hand side. You can see Tel Amarna, which is a very large city. This is probably a city which is evident in uh, this is probably a city which is evident in um, which is evident uh, even in the Buddhist. If you look at ancient sketches on, so I think I've shown you one or two. If I have not, and then I'm mistaken of Sachi or of Bharut or of uh, other cities like Vaishali. Uh, you'll see sketches like this, you know, similar kind of town planning layouts, building complexes with large open spaces, small open spaces, distributions of public zones, semi-public zones and private zones. Very, very interesting, which shows that scholars and builders all over the world, you know, they build in the same fashion. There is some universal pattern, even though the civilizations are connected, even though the civilizations are not connected, there is always a universal pattern, but somehow we have proofs that they are connected. You know, so this is Tel Al Amarna. So Tal, the word Tal, it comes from the ancient word Tala. Tala means Talao. India mein hum log bolta hai na Talao. Talao means niche jo hai. Niche kya hai? Pani hai. What is Pani? Pani is life. What is life? Life is immortality. So in the same way, Tala me. Pharaoh log bhi hai. In, deep inside the pyramid, you have the Tal. So it is from this word Tal, the modern words have come in Israel and other Middle Eastern cities like Tel Aviv, you know, Tel Aviv, you know, Tel Shamra, you know, you know, you know. So, so it is a very ancient word that has survived even to the in, to, even till the modern time. So if the English word is tail, T-A-I-L, which means niche mein jo hai, and the Sanskrit word is talla. Niche jo mein. Ek talla mein kya hai? Char talla mein kya hai? You know. So we go from level to level. Ek star mein kya hai? So what star? Pehla star mein kya hai? Dusra star mein kya hai? Which means first story mein kya hai? So star is story. And tal is talla. You know. So these are very strong architectural glossary words which are universal in Egypt, in India, in ancient Greek literature. They cross cut the entire vocabulary of global syntax of architecture. So Egypt gives us a strong repository of understanding such architectural vocabulary of words. It's very, very important. So you are a brilliant group of people. I'll expect that in your work, you will be able to rediscover some of these ancient connections which are very modern and which are even valid today, which are very even valid today. So I move on to a slide which is on patterns and icons. I think I have already described a little bit this to you. Confirm when you can see this slide. So this slide is on. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Shivangi. So this slide is on uh, the various symbols. So on the top left, you can see the falcon bird, which is lightning from the sky. And you can see the two lightnings coming together, which is in the, in the, in the middle left. And this is the column of life. You can see the eye of Horus, which is the red sun, which is immortality. Niche me, you can see the, the mansion of the car and the bar where they're weighing after life. Before you can join after life, they'll check how much of good work and bad work you're doing. That is exactly matching with the Indian ideas of the law of causation, karma fal baad. If you do good work, you have good results. No, this is Newton's third law. Newton said force is equal to mass into acceleration and D. Allenbert says force minus mass into acceleration is equal to zero. So if you have a lot of good work, which is mass into acceleration, you'll be able to cancel your material force and the resultant will be zero. If the resultant is zero, then you achieve fulcrum, which is Libra, which is one of the symbol of Uttarayan, which is the northern solstice, and there the, your good deeds are balanced, your bad deeds are balanced by your good deeds, and you achieve the zero point, 
If you achieve the zero point, then your eye opens up, which is ank, which you can see, which is a symbol of ladies today. And then the serpent on your forehead is awakened and your third eye opens up, which is evident in the top right. That's a pharaoh. So these are strange similarities between Egypt and Indians systems of yoga. So this is known as the Urius and the Ankh. It is up to you to get interested in all this. So this is absolutely simple if you want to see them simply. But if you think they are very complex symbols, then they are very complex. So with this, I move on to the next slide. So this whole journey of going from this world to that other world as as afterlife and then coming back from the afterlife to this world, you know, like Jesus or Buddha as a raised Pharaoh, which is which is resurrection, you know, like Jesus Christ is portrayed. If you can see this slide, if you can see this slide. So this two journeys of the upper from Nietzsche se upar mein jana, from the material world to the spiritual world, from the somatic world to the psychic world, you know, from the terrestrial world to the to the astral world, and then coming back from the astral world, you know, like you know, like Cinderella, Snow White, and the seven giants, the the seven dwarfs, the seven sages, you know, the seven sages have come from the celestial world to the material world to found the Vedic civilization. So this is the two-way journey that's symbolized by the solar bark, symbolized by the solar bark. And this is a symbol of the upper Nile boat and the lower Nile boat. So every Nile boat, as you can see in the top middle, the second one, so every Nile boat with the Pharaoh who is resurrected is symbolized by a star in the heaven. So these are the various uh, astral symbols which were venerated and worshipped in Egypt. And Nietzsche may you can see the connection which is restored, which is the Soma Taui, which I have described you before. And on the right hand side, this is a very complex map of Egypt because normally we hear about, hear about Memphis, where Elvis Presley was born. So Memphis is not only in Egypt, but it's also in US. You know, so the American civilization rediscovered many of these Egyptian cities, you know, Memphis, Saqqara and all that. You know, I think, you know, the US also has five or six cities of Calcutta, you know, you know the US has that. I think, you know, Shivangi, I think, you know, US has a US has about five Calcutta cities. You know, five. If you search Calcutta in US, you find five Calcutta cities. Yeah, that's very interesting. The American civilization is a very interesting civilization where they have revived the ancient world. So this is the Nile boat civilization, the two way Nile boat. And I think the story is fairly clear, and this is how it's described in the in the in the temple of Karnak, which almost looks like the a South Indian temple with Gopuram. So I've changed the slide. You tell me when you can see this slide. You tell me, huh? Yes, sir. Sir. Yeah. So you can see. If I don't tell you that this is an Egyptian temple in Upper Egypt, in Southern Egypt, you'll probably think. This is a South Indian temple of Gopurams, Srirangam temple, or Chidambaram temple, or Min Minakshi Madurai temple, or Ranganatham temple. So the Egyptians had very strong similarities with the layouts of Dravidian South Indian temple and the kind of temple structures they had built. So as I told you, I'm moving on to the next slide. I told you the Egyptians had very strong similarities between vegetation myths of death and afterlife and resurrection and their kings and queens and pharaohs. You tell me when you can see this. Slide. So if you abjo niche me ao, if you can see in the bottom, you can see the Egyptian pharaoh is resurrected, who represents an Egyptian god. And you can see the new corn seeds, the new sprouts are coming out from his body. And he's and he's right and he's and he is resting on the foundations of the reeds of the reed bones of the reed bamboo reed sheets in india there is a similar story which is described in in a, in a certain thing who in his last age before his death he was also lying like this can someone tell me who is he
anyone in the class basement pitama oh absolutely who is this who is this hello हम लोग का विश्व पितामा कौन था भाई हेलो So let's unmute and give a big hand to Neeraj. Let's unmute. Great. So you see a strange similarity between ancient Egyptian beliefs and that which existed in India. So I think we have almost come to an end of our ideas and everything. And on the right hand side, you can see the geographical scape of Egypt. You know, so you can see the lower blob, which is Upper Egypt. and the and the and the upper block which is lower egypt so by the term lower and upper we go by the geographical altitude either you are in the nile valley or you are in the upper hill valley and finally the nile originates from the from the from the tip of mount kilimanjaro mount kilimanjaro which is a very famous volcanic mountain in central africa so i have gone on to the next slide which is the inverted view of life yeah so i think i have described this so you tell me when this slide is particularly visible shivangi thoda confirm karo yeah if you can see this slide we see yes, sir. That, that the egypt that the pyramid is exactly aligned with the with the distribution of the star orion and sirius so the resurrection of the pharaoh from the body of the pyramid is absolutely aligned so this is rq astronomy as it's evident in the microsoft software so there are a lot of scholars who have done work like this so one of the work so shivangi please note that one of the groups will be working on the rq astronomical implications and the software applications of egyptian structures theek hai na theek hai okay shivangi Let 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 us have a different kind of a submission this year. You know, mostly based on geometry patterns, software applications, and the orientations of material, mundane structures on the ground, with astral patterns as evident in the night sky, in the in the hilly, in the in the in the in the, in the sky dome, in the sky dome. Okay. okay These are some similarities between the Indus Valley sill, which is the double unicorn, which also has. similar agrarian or vegetational symbols and the other kind of symbols so on the top of the queen so this is lady isis you can see the same kind of symbol that you see in india you can see the moon and the sun and that you normally see in india the moon and the sun can everybody see it the moon and the sun as a headdress of isis she is the mother goddess of egypt so these are the symbols which is run down and finally it became the symbol of egypt and the moon and the sun was replaced by the star venus in the night sky because the islam believed in a lunar calendar and was more interested in the night sky rather than the day sky you know whereas christianity believed in the morning sky so that's why the resurrection of christ is the resurrection of christ the resurrection the resurrection of the resurrection of the resurrection of uh, of 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 christ is more associated with with uh, with the sun and that's why cross christ resurrection is known as the pentecost or the wit sun tide or the wit sun tide or the wit sun tide okay okay so this is something which is very very important and interesting to to understand okay so one is a lunar side one is a solar side in india we have both the sides okay so this is about the mansion the mansion of the ka which i mentioned the mansion of the ka which is a symbol and the mansion of the ba which is also described in the rigveda shivangi you confirm when you can see this slide
Can you see this light? Yes. Not yet, sir. Not yet. Yes, sir. It's there. So these are some of the deep principles of the car, which is that means a pharaoh is able to resurrect. He is in a position to resurrect, which means his good work, his good deeds are much more than his bad deeds. And when that happens, the ba, the celestial spirit comes and joins. It becomes the Kaaba. And that is the foundation of Islam, also the stone of Kaaba. It comes from Egypt. Is Incidentally, Ka is the first consonant in Sanskrit literature. Ba is a middle consonant in Sanskrit literature. And then the Kaaba goes into the celestial heavens and joins La. So it becomes Kaaba La, which is the foundation of Jew. Judaic mysticism, which is the foundation of Judaic mysticism. And this is actually discovered in the mansion of the car. I move. I've moved on to the next slide, Shivangi. Class, I moved on to the next slide. So tell me when, so you can see the mansion of the car. You can see the mansion of the car. And it's communication with the car. It's happening at the Sakara Hector. So you can see there is a nice cartoon or a sketch done by that the car is able to resurrect and it joins the bar from the mummy and it finally be, goes into the celestial heavens. So this is described by uh, the great archaeologist, which is Margaret Murray. So by Margaret Murray, she was a London archaeologist, as I told you, and she gave her entire life after the recovery of Egyptian Egyptian folk loaves. And that was transmuted and transcribed into into these forms. So you can uh, you can take screenshots. And uh, I, I think you have seen Shivangidi is very kindly. Uploading the lectures on the YouTube. So if you're interested, you can always come back to the YouTubes and see them for yourselves. And we can always have a special class. Guys, if you are interested to know more, I'm not an expert. I don't know more, but I know a little more than what I'm saying in this class, because otherwise will take up a lot of time. We'll end in another 10, 12 minutes. Don't worry. OK, so this is a very important slide. I've changed the slide. Tell me when you can see this slide. This is done by the National Geographic Scientist, the world's number one exploration science magazine. National yes. This is from October 2002. No, and this is a wonderful thing where the entire description of the Egyptian journey is described. So on the left, you can see. That a successful Pharaoh. Or a good Egyptian is is raised because his car or the life force is balanced in the in the middle unit in the presence of an you know, Sobek in the Libra so that it's raised above and is joining the bar. Which is shown in the right top. You can see the bar. And once the car joins the bar, then then, then and when, once the once the car, once the car joins the bar, then finally it gets raised and enters the celestial heavens and becomes a pharaoh in the sky. So it, like India in Egyptian mythology, every star few million light a few million light years away is actually the the light of a particular race soul so though we are calling it materially a sun but spiritually deep inside there is a great soul you know this is the belief of ancient indian egyptian spirituality which also recurs in 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 ancient india so this is the entire symbol of what you call the kaaba and the la and this is beautifully designed and sketched by 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 this Egyptian scholars in this. And if your good deeds are less than the bad deeds, then you are not able to pass through this. So this is called the gospel of the Passover. If you look at Christianity, you'll see that before Christ resurrection, there's a celebration of the lamb, which is called the Passover lamb. So this entire Trist of Passover comes from Egypt. It comes from ancient Egypt or some other distant land. So Christianity inherits about 80 to 85 percent of its symbolism from 
pre-Christian pagan origin. Though Christianity calls it pagan, but it owes about 80% of its words, ideals, philosophies to an age which precedes Christianity by a few thousand years. This is something which was shown in the first 15 minutes in the movie Da Vinci Code. Uh, if you have seen that movie, if you have not seen that movie, I'll suggest you see the first 15 or 20 minutes of this movie. Please see that movie. You'll understand what I'm saying, where they, where they show Professor Robert Langdon of Harvard University trying to explain the origins of Christianity. Okay, so with this, I come on to the next slide. I think I've already explained this and they're already evident. So they have parallels. They have parallels between Egypt's ideas of resurrection and Vedic ideas about Maha Siddhi or Maha Nirvan that happens to meditation. That is the similarity. I hope you can yes, see yes. the slide. Yeah, I, 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 I hope you can see the slide. But the difference is that Egyptians finally transferred the entire thing into a material world. But in, in India, it remained principally in the spiritual world, in the world of meditation, in the world of meditation, in the world of meditation. It remained in the world of meditation. So, and it is evident in a hymn called the Prajapati hymn. Okay. Okay, so I'm moving close. So this is on the unification of the two series. I'm moving to the next slide. And this is on Margaret Murray. And uh, she has worked on the ancient principles of the of the red and the blue series of Egypt. I hope this is visible. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So on this slide, I'll talk later when I show you that slide connecting histories with Shivangidi will remind me. So this is Margaret Alice Mary. She was born in India, 13th of July, 1863, Calcutta, British India. And then she went back to England and she dedicated her entire life to the study of Egypt. And it was from this background of the blue and the red series about 100 years later, Lee Corbusier derived his modular principle, which also comes partly from Egypt, partly from Greece and partly from India. So I think I've come almost to the end of my slide. So the Egyptians time and again, this is my last slide. You tell me when it is visible. So this is actually the, the great book written by Margaret A. Murray. And, and yes, sir. I have said that the Egyptians as a race had moved on from, from other lands, from, from a distant land, which they used to call the land of God, the land of divinity, the land of the land of great, the land of great, uh, the land of great furnishing, the land of great spices, the land of peacock, the land of ivory, the land of uh, gold, the land of ornamentation, and the land of religion, meditation, spirituality, and inspiration. So scholars have actually figured out that the land probably belonged to Arabia, the land belonged to Phoenicia, which is Turkey, or the land belonged to Oman, things like that. But Margaret Murray had dedicated all his all her life and said that if there is one country which produces ivory, peacocks, spices, systems, onyx, the ideas about transmigration, spirituality, meditation, double soul after life, then it has to be India. There's no other country, especially peacock is there. Peacock is also there in Persia, but in, in the ancient time, India and Persia shared a lot of common. So it is believed that the Egyptians as a body of race. Now, this is something which is very enigmatic. The Egyptians a, as a body of race because something happened in India and they transferred from there and they built the famous civilizations of the pharaohs of Ramesses, of Ramesses. Now, now I will give you a clue. Now I will give you a clue. So now scholars have found out that the ancient name of Egyptian East Egypt was known as Kush, Kush, which today is known as Sudan or Abyssinia or, or Ethiopia, K-U-S-H. And the ancient name of Egypt of West, Western Egypt was known as Lub, 
which is known as Libya today. So if that is true, and if the name of the Egyptian pharaohs are known as Ramesses I, Ramesses II, so if you get Ramesses, Love and Kush together, then there is some big question about the origin of Egyptians from where they have come from. Now, this is all about archaeology. This is all about geo-archaeoastronomy. This is all about detailed archaeological exploration. There is no hocus. There is no hocus pocus. There is no speculation here. This is all science. And you can see the book written by Dr. Murray, which is known as the Land of Punt. So I'll request a portion of the group, the, the group who is working on Egypt, to focus on the Land of Punt and to focus on the latest scientific archaeoastronomical softwares working on the geo astral orientation of the Egyptian pyramids. OK, so with this, uh, we come to the end of Egypt, the modern cities of Heliopolis, which is Egypt. I'm almost coming to the end of Egypt. I think I'll cover these later and uh, I'll go a little faster. And uh, and and uh, and with this, uh, it was in Heliopolis. Can you see this slide, Heliopolis? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yeah, so in the slide, Heliopolis, it is in this city, the Egyptians celebrated the ancient sun god Atum, A-T-U-M, and they believed that the sun was a single corpuscular element of the whole universe. And the ancient Egyptians taught the Greece, which is visible here. So it is from this ancient word Atum, the word Atom, the word Atom actually emerges, which is the foundation of the Greek school of Leucippus and Democritus. And finally, after 3000 years, they are developed by Rutherford, Bohr and Albert Einstein and others into the atomic concepts of the modern quantum world. So I think you can see this slide where you can read the concept of atom. Shivangi, it's visible? Concept. Yes. Yes. So, so the the birth of science of atomic theory goes back to his to its to Egypt, and very interestingly, the word atom is very close to the Sanskrit ancient word, which is atma or atama or atoma or automated, which also means a single unit of life in this universe, which is the Upanishadic or the Vedantic descriptions of life principle, which is Atma or Atam or Atama or automation. So this is all about words. It is up to you to explore this. Not something. This is something very, very interesting. So I think we'll will. Uh, I've come to the last slide. So this is about the assignment. Uh, uh, this is about the assignment. And I think uh, I have to change the dates a little bit. I have to. I didn't change the dates. So this will be like September. So this will be September. I hope you can see the slide. Yes, sir. So Shivangi. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, my voice is breaking. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. Sir. Okay. So this is about. So if you have, uh, we have about 48 people. So if we have about, if we have about five groups. I think we can have groups of eight. Ye yes, sir. Yeah. So I think you assign the groups of eight, and uh, and uh, and they will be working on the Persian architecture, especially on the research things of the Garden of Eden. Sumerian age. So these are the various combinations, you know. Um, so the source is Persian architecture, Sumerian age, Scotimian era, Assyrian times, and Christian impacts. And the research themes are Garden of Eden, Temple layouts, engineering vision, and cultural semantics. And to this I add, I also add archaeo astronomical implications. Do that. So this is a combination. So so Shivangi, what I can do is uh, if I can manage by tomorrow or day after tomorrow, 
I'll make a little statement of four five lines, and then you can send it to the whole class. Okay, na? Okay, sir. Okay, okay. So with this class, we are coming to an end. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Ah, uh, sir. Uh, were you saying that the groups will be of uh, like, will there be five groups of eight people each? I mean, how how 